Welcome back, folks. Today we're going to look at the syntax of predicate logic. This video presupposes that you already have some familiarity with quantifiers and the basic object predicate structure of predicate logic. Here we're going to look at the definition of a formula in predicate logic, and we're going to look at some tricky issues of translation from natural language into predicate logic. So first thing to be careful about is sentences with more than one quantifier. Consider here A and B. A says everyone loves someone and B says someone is loved by everyone. These are two very similar sentences. And the first thing we want to point out is that they are similar but different. Second thing we want to point out is that they contain two quantifiers. Here we have everyone and someone. Both of these are quantificational phrases. Now, B has the very same quantificational phrases, the very same relational predicate, but the quantifiers are in a different order. So order counts with quantifiers. Now, when you're trying to translate sentences with more than one quantifier, as with any sentence, your job is to ask yourself, under what conditions are these sentences true? And what you need to capture with your translation is those truth conditions. So A is true in a situation which everyone has fallen in love with a person, whoever they are. It doesn't matter whether everyone has fallen in love with the same person or with someone different. Whereas what B is communicating is that there's some one person and everyone loves that one person. A and B represent two very different situations in the world. So our logical translation needs to represent these differently. The way to do this is to switch the order of the quantifiers. Notice in both translations we have LXY as our relational predicate, but the order of the quantifiers is switched. Here at the top we have for all X there is a Y such that X loves Y. At the bottom we have there is a Y such that for all X, X loves Y. These look very similar, but they have very different meanings. Again, for all x there is a y that such that x loves y tells us that everyone loves someone. Each pair might be different, whereas b tells us that there's some one person and everyone loves that very same person. So order of so big picture here, order of quantifiers counts, and we need to think about the order of the quantifiers when we're using sentences that have multiple quantificational phrases in them. Now we need to introduce the notion of a bound variable and a free variable. Remember, X and Y are variables. They're not like A, B, and C, which stand in for names of a specific person. X and Y, we don't know who X and Y are in, in particular. We're just saying everyone, and someone. No particular object is being denoted here. Now notice that in both A and B, X and Y each have a quantifier that is binding them. That is to say we have a quantifier attached to the X and a quantifier attached to the Y. So LXY here contains no instances of free variables. All of the variables in these are bound variables. Contrast those examples with these new ones, LXY and for all X, LXY. Notice that in these cases, if we look at C, X and Y here have no quantifiers corresponding to them. That means that both X and Y occur free in this one. In D, however, we have an universal quantifier corresponding to the X variable. So X is bound, but Y is free in this case. So very important distinction between free variables and bound variables. A free variable is when there's no quantifier corresponding to that variable. And a bound variable is when there is a quantifier corresponding to that variable. Unlike propositional logic, where a formula and a sentence go together, here there's a difference in predicate logic between a formula and a sentence. So C and D here both have free variables and they are well formed. That is to say, syntactically, these are perfectly legitimate. But they do not create complete sentences. 
That is to say, this is what's called a propositional function, not a proposition. What that means, we'll say more about in the next slide. But the basic idea here is that C and D cannot be true or false. We don't know how to evaluate the truth or falsity of these. Let's say a little bit more about why that's so. Intuitively, C is like saying, this loves that, over the phone without pointing at anything, so you have no idea what this and that are referring to. So if I just tell you this loves that, you have no way of deciding what this and that are referring to. There's an indeterminacy here. So this doesn't create a sentence that can be true or false. C has no truth value because we have no idea what X and Y are going to stand for. So these are called propositional functions because if we did substitute a name for these, then we could determine a proposition. So suppose we put in for X, Anne, and for Y, Bill, then we have Anne loves Bill, then we have a proposition. So formulas with free variables are called propositional functions because they're functions from the domain of objects to a proposition. If we were to complete this indeterminate proposition by plugging in names, then we would get a proposition fully determined. So this is called a propositional function. Same thing here, any, any formula with any free variables, even if some of the variables are bound, is a mere propositional function. It stands in need of being turned into a fully fledged proposition. Now there are two ways to do that. One way is we could go into C and put in and for X and Bill for Y or choose whatever names you want. The other way to turn this into a fully determined proposition is to bind each of the variables with quantifiers as in A and B. So A and B represent fully formed propositions C and D represent propositional functions. They're indeterminate. They stand in need of determination before they become propositions. But they're still well-formed formulas. Now is the time to introduce our official definition of the syntax for predicate logic. This is where we define what formulas and combinations of formulas are permissible according to our formulation rules. The basic ingredients of all the formulas of predicate logic include a set of individual constants. These constants name objects, so they're not they're constant rather than variable. We then have a class of predicate letters. These are general properties rather than naming objects. They relate they name properties, relations, or classes of objects. Finally, we have our variables, and this collection of individual constants, predicate letters, and variables is the vocabulary. Again, the ingredients out of which we can build any of the infinite number of predicate of formulas of predicate logic. Given these ingredients, we can then define formulas. An atomic formula is something like FD or GH or RYB. In all cases, an atomic formula is the combination of a constant or a variable with a predicate letter. Once we have this set of atomic formulas, we can then use the usual logical connectives so if phi is a formula, then not phi is a formula. Anytime you have a well-formed formula, however complex, you can stick a negation in front of it and get a new formula. We're all familiar with the two-place logical connectives. We have conjunction, we have disjunction, and we have the arrow. Anytime you have a well-formed formula phi and a well-formed formula psi, no matter how internally complex these are, you can stick a uh, conjunction in between, you can get you stick a disjunction in between, or you can stick an arrow in between, and you get a new well-formed formula. The big new thing here then is the quantifiers. If you have a well-formed formula with a free variable in it, then you can bind that variable with the quantifier, that is to say stick a quantifier in front of it. Now notice Phi x might al already contain other quantifiers. And that's okay. We can do multi multiple quantifiers with a nested depth. That's one of the brilliant, powerful aspects of this new mathematical logic as opposed to anything that came before. Now, one restriction on this is that notice phi x is a formula with x free. If x is already bound by a quantifier, 
we cannot just stick another quantifier in. Suppose phi is shorthand for for all x, fx. Well, in that case, x is not free. X is already bound by the universal quantifier. So we're not allowed in that case to just stick an existential quantifier there because then we don't know which variable is binding X. So the key here is that when you have a formula with a free variable X, then you can bind it with a quantifier. But if that variable is already bound, then you can't rebind it with a new quantifier. So here's a little exercise. If you want to pause the video and carry out this exercise, that would be advisable. What you want to do here is look at these formulas and based on the formulation rules that we just went over, decide whether these are well-formed, which ones are well-formed, which ones are not. Well, here's the answer. All of the ones in red are not well-formed. Notice in number three, we have a couple of things wrong here. We have a predicate letter with no name or variable attached to it, so you can never just have a freestanding predicate letter without a smaller lowercase name or variable. And then we have here two individual constants, A and B, with no predicate letter. So individual constants belong to predicate letters, and predicate letters belong to individual constants. You can't have those occurring on their own. Notice over here, we also have a problem. LX is looking okay. We have a predicate letter, and then we have a variable. That's fine. But then we have a quantifier out here. There is no free variable for this quantifier to bind. So that's no good. You can't just have a quantifier that binds nothing at all. The other thing is that you'll never see a quantifier just at the end of a sentence here. Number four, we just have a free-floating quantifier. That's just a meaningless statement here. Here we have another quantifier and then a couple logical connectives just following them. There's, there's no sense that can be made of this. There's a bunch of problems here. For one thing, there's no free variable that this quantifier is binding. For another thing, there are no atomic formulas that are the basis for these logical connectives, so lots going wrong there. Nine and 10 are wrong as well, since look at if we look at number nine, we have a predicate letter that's just lonely with no individual constants and no variables, and we have quantifiers that are binding nothing at all. Big problem there. And for number 10, we have Quantifiers and variables, that's okay, right? These are these quantifiers correspond to variables, so that's good, but there's no predicate letter. There's just some lonely variables.